to speak on a familiar uh, theme that is post times and uh, post modern times uh, evokes quite a few uh, images uh, that are uh, some we can say dominant images some uh, upcoming images and that is something that usually happens with history that you have uh, different perspectives struggling to assume the mainstream uh, position uh, of uh, historical scholarship so mote taur par jo main kehna cha raha hu wo ye hai ki jo mauryo ke baad ka kaal hai prachin kaal mein जैसे अगर आप इसकी टाइमलाइन देखें तो ये मोटे तौर से 180 ईसा पूर्व से लेकर 320 ईसवी तक क्योंकि 320 के बाद फिर गुप्त काल का उदय हो जाता है तो बिफोर बिफोर वी गेट इनटू द डिटेल्स ऑफ टुडेज लेक्चर लेट मी फर्स्ट लेट मी फर्स्ट जस्ट टेल यू एस टू वॉट माई स्कीम ऑफ Uh, this uh, talk is and the scheme is that i will first outline two three broader aspects of history historical understanding and historical inquiry then we will get into the usual track of uh, uh, you know uh, detailing things uh, in economic terms in social terms in political terms and also in religious terms and then we will come back to the original questions that we had posed and try and see uh, answers uh, whether uh, we are able to frame this timeline this time period post modern period uh, the period that is sandwiched between the two big dynasties like uh, the mauryas and the guptas and try and see what kinds of historical trajectories could have its way during this period or maybe that uh, there are some distinct uh, historical forces that were unleashed only at around this point of time that went on to accord uh, a character to indian history some and some of these characters are very durable they they survive to the present day the uh, the, the foremost example that i can uh, straight away cite just to Uh, just to uh, give a sense that we are not talking of something that is dead and uh, over the the shape of the coins that we still have in india is circular right is round shape and they usually carry the bust images of uh, quite a few leaders of repute and so forth uh, even in the present times and they, uh, there is the date uh, that is the year of issuing embossed on it Uh, whether it was issued in 1980 or 1990 or 1995 they are all embossed now these traditions are some uh, these these are some of the traditions that began at around this uh, period similarly uh, when you look at the images or the sculptures of say buddh uh, jain uh, mahavir jain or several other deities uh, all of us know that uh, gautam buddha was born in what today we know as nepal and uh, he doesn't look like one in these sculptures if you are aware of the facial uh, you know make of uh, the people of nepal gautam buddha doesn't look like one why doesn't he look like one that's because the uh, sculpturing tradition by which the sculptures or images of buddha or several other deities uh in jain tradition or even in hindu tradition they were all sculptured or they started getting sculptured at around this point of time with a distinct fashion that we know of through uh, gandhar art or mathura art and so forth and therefore they bear a distinct stamp of that and uh, that's why they appear the way they appear and they don't appear uh, as they should have appeared uh, going by the nativistic term Uh, going by the nativistic sense of their uh, point of origin and so forth so these are some of the surviving uh, traditions that uh, took shape for the first time in the post modern period and they continue to the uh, present times of course what if you traditions began and uh, either merged or dovetailed into some bigger traditions uh, similarly uh, quite a few traditions were already on uh, from the earlier period 
and uh, they got further intensified during this period of time. Quite a few traditions that uh, began in the earlier period uh, fizzled out at around this point of time. So these are some of the things that we uh, would be taking a stock of once we are done with the detailing of uh, this period. So jab, uh, uh, hum, uh, पूरा विस्तार से हम लोग इस चीज को खत्म कर लेंगे कि पोस्ट मॉडर्न टाइम्स में राजनीतिक रूप से सामाजिक रूप से धार्मिक रूप से क्या परिवर्तन आए उसके पश्चात हम लोग इन मसलों पर जो कि इतिहास के बड़े मसले हैं उस पर भी थोड़ा विचार करने की कोशिश करेंगे यह भी विचार करने की कोशिश करेंगे कि जो हमारा मौर्यो का जो एक डोमिनेंट इमेज है तो मौर्य काल का जो डोमिनेंट इमेज है कि वो कितना केंद्रीयकृत था या केंद्रीयकृत नहीं था अगर था तो फिर उसके बाद के काल में उसका क्या हश्र हुआ तो ये सारी बातों का भी आकलन हमें खुद ब खुद जो मौर्योत्तर काल है उसके ऊपर जो आज चर्चा होगी उससे एक अंदाजा लग जाए कि जो लैंड ओनरशिप का मसला है वो लैंड ओनरशिप का मसला क्यों इसमें बदलता हुआ दिख रहा है मौर्य काल के संदर्भ में या मौर्य काल के कंपैरिजन में और ये सभी महत्वपूर्ण मसले हैं और इसलिए महत्वपूर्ण मसले हैं क्योंकि और एक आ, मोटी बात मैं कर कर फिर इसके डिटेलिंग में आ रहा हूं वह ये है कि अक्सर हम इतिहास लेखन में एक ट्रेडिशन रही है कि अभी भी जैसे जो टॉपिक जो नामकरण जो टॉपिक का किया गया आज के विषय का वो है पोस्ट मॉरियन टाइम्स ना दिस पोस्ट मॉरियन इज इज पोलिटिकल एपेलेशन ना वी आर टॉकिंग ऑफ अराउंड फोर फाइव सेंचुरी सेकेंड सेंचुरी बी सी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी बी सी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी एडी सेकेंड सेंचुरी एडी एंड ऑल्सो थर्ड सेंचुरी एडी सो वी आर डीलिंग विथ फाइव डिस्टिंक्ट सेंचुरीज टू बिफोर द कॉमन एरा एंड थ्री आफ्टर द बिगनिंग ऑफ द कॉमन एरा एंड वॉट इज द टर्म दैट वी आर यूजिंग फॉर दैट दैट इज अ डायनेस्टिक एपेलेशन तो एक मौर्य काल ये जो मौर्य साम्राज्य था उसके बाद का काल ना दीज आर डायनेस्टिक एपेलेशन दे मे नॉट ऑलवेज दे आर नॉट को टर्मिनस एंड को एक्सटेंसिव विथ इकोनॉमिक चेंजेस विथ सोशल चेंजेस विथ रिलीजियस चेंजेस तो अगर यह आप सोच रहे हैं कि मौर्य साम्राज्य जो कि एक विकसित बड़ा विशाल साम्राज्य था उसके विघटन हो जाने के उसके विघटन के पश्चात इस समय अर्थव्यवस्था भी विघटित हो गई होगी खंडित हो गई होगी या धर्म में भी आमूलचूल परिवर्तन आ गया होगा तो जो पॉलिटिकल प्रोजेक्टरी है उसके साथ साथ इकोनॉमिक और सोशल प्रोजेक्टरी को देखने की जरूरत नहीं है दे कैन बी नॉट ऑलवेज सिंक्रोनस दे आर नॉट ऑलवेज सिंक्रोनस सो पोलिटिकल फ्रेगमेंटेशन मे नॉट नेसेसरिली लीड टू इकोनॉमिक क्योस so india was doing uh, perfectly all right in fact it this post modern times represents the climax of the process of uh, urbanization of the process of uh, uh, trade commerce uh, uh, or the intensification of trade and commerce uh, more number of coins could be seen the material culture was uh, more impressive as compared to the modern times and this is despite that we do not have and Uh, a, a pan indian overarching empire the way we had in the mauryan times so these are some of the critical uh, issues big issues of historiography that uh, we would seek uh, uh, to answer by detailing uh, what we intend to do for the post mauryan times today so uh, uh, the first thing that we can think of is to just have the image of the mauryan map uh, इन आर माइंड तो अगर आप मौर्य साम्राज्य का मैप अपने दिमाग में रखें तो इन दी नॉर्थ ईस्ट इट एक्सटेंड सब टू से ईरान एरिया इन द ईस्ट इट सॉरी इन दी नॉर्थ वेस्ट इट गोज अप टू ईरान एरिया इन द ईस्ट इट गोज अप टू बंगाल एंड देन डाउन साउथ बारिंग तमिलनाडु एंड केरल ऑफ टूडे Uh, the other parts of the Indian subcontinent, the Deccan uh, and so forth, they were all part of uh, Mauryan Empire. So, more than what we understand today as the subcontinental India was under the control of the Mauryan uh, polity. And if you 
juxtapose this to the post-Mauryan times, then if you think of, uh, you pull out uh, any map uh, from any textbook, say of second century AD India, what do you get? The entire map is dotted with several dynasties. So you will get in the Bihar area, Shungas, Kanvas, then you have in the Rajasthan area, your Vayas, then you have uh, uh, in the Northwest, several Indo-Greek uh, uh, dynasties, you have Parthians, you have uh, uh, Shakas, you have uh, uh, the Kushanas, uh, then uh, in the Western part of India, you have Satavahans and so forth. And down south, if you go, you start getting evidence of the Sangam age, uh, uh, chiefdom, uh, chiefdoms, uh, uh, Chol, Chere, Pandya, Satyaputras, and so forth. So this is, the, and, and again, if you go to the Urisa area, you have the Hathi Gumpha inscription informing us about the Kharvel king, uh, the, the uh, Maha uh, Meg Varman uh, dynasty, uh, which had the pompous claim of even defeating uh, Magad. Uh, during its days in the uh, Hathi Gufa inscription, they, they claim so. Similarly, you have uh, the uh, Shakas, the Rudradamans, the uh, Gautami Putra Shakarni, uh, Satvahan ruler. So this is the, uh, this is the political uh, scenario that you get uh, on the map of uh, post mauryan times. And th this is to be contrasted with the uh, compactness uh, and uh, extensiveness of the uh, Mauryan Empire. And so quite a few imageries flow from this comparison and we would try to, uh, we would try to examine whether those imageries are realistic or it is more as a part of some historical construct. The facts uh, do not quite uh, gel with it. So uh, this is the exercise that we are trying to do. So having, uh, uh, having discussed uh, these uh, uh, dynastic uh, presence in the post modern times in uh, reasonable uh, uh, detail. Uh, let's move on to, uh, to uh, the more critical issue of uh, society and economy, uh, because uh, I think, yeah, uh, before we do that, uh, let's uh, understand a couple of things. Uh, the Mauryans, despite being the imperial uh, despite being of imperial proportion, perhaps did not issue their own coins. And their coins, uh, or the coins belonging to the Mauryan period, is probably, uh, or were probably issued by the trade guilds or manufacturing guilds and so forth. So coins up to the Mauryan period is not symptomatic of the sovereign status of the ruler. And ruler did not, or ruling houses did not have uh, royal means. And this is th this tradition is something that began from the uh, Indo Greeks, who started issuing coins uh, from the uh, political, uh, uh, from the centers of political sovereignty. And thereafter, or ever since, that that has been the practice uh, in Indian history as well. So Kushan uh, probably were the first uh, who started uh, using uh, very uh, uniform, uh, systematized uh, coins, including uh, as a new entrant, the gold coins. And they were circular coins. If you compare that to the modern times, modern uh, uh, punch mark coins were not circular. They were of irregular shape. They were made, they were made of silver. Uh, and uh, uh, it was, uh, they were intrinsic coins, so it was uh, by proportion of weight uh, that den denominations were cut. Or, when we look at the time of the Kushan, we see that the coins that are in Bharat were made in Bharat, they were in circular uh, shape. In that, the kings of the अंकित होते थे, डेट उसमें दिया होता था और इतिहासकारों के लिए एक बड़ी बात हो गई क्योंकि भारतीय प्राचीन भारतीय इतिहास में खास करकर यह एक बड़ी समस्या रही है कि डेट को कैसे उसकी क्रोनोलॉजी कैसे सेट किया जाए तो निमिसमैटिक स्टडीज भी इसमें काफी सहायक सिद्ध होता है कि वो डेट्स के बारे में भी हमें एक स्केलेटल इंफॉर्मेशन दे देता है so uh, that is uh, that is uh, yet another thing uh, that is important for us to understand then uh, 
what we get uh, to know in terms of uh, South India, that is peninsular India, uh, beyond Deccan area, the peninsular tip. In the postmodern period, what we get as evidence is uh, Sangam literature. Now, Sangam literature by itself uh, is not uh, intended as a historical literature, uh, which was written for posterity to uh, inform about the present times as such. Sangam literature, Mulata uh, love poems, hai, and uh, what you have is uh, the areas, the sensibilities are expressed in uh, ecological vocabulary. So the ecological categories are very prominent in uh, Sangam literature. For example, if you have to express love and there you, you get to have this sense of the impact of the postmodern times. I'm talking of Sangam literature, which legitimately chronologically is part of the postmodern uh, uh, times. And uh, suppose uh, two lovers are to meet, two lovers are romancing. Sir, I... So I was talking about the Sangam age and uh, uh, even, uh, uh, even, uh, even uh, sensibilities like love, hate, uh, uh, jealousy, all these things are expressed in Sangam literature through ecological categories. So Marutam, which is the green patch, which is the alluvial area where, uh, where uh, plants can grow and so forth, uh, they would designate uh, happy moments, they would designate meeting of the lovers, whereas desert area, Palai, or, or there are some other uh, uh, denominations for uh, coastal area and so forth, they would uh, represent uh, separation of lovers. And you know, the, the profoundity of this, profoundity of the impact of this kind of uh, literary presentation is something that you can see even in the present day Bollywood films. If two lovers are separated, the usual backdrop, the pictorial backdrop is that of desert. If the lovers meet, they are romancing. The pictorial backdrop is that uh, of some green patch uh, in a garden, uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in a green uh, area, in a forest area. So, uh, you know, uh, these emotions are uh, depicted that way. But uh, uh, talking about the political uh, situation of the Sangam age, uh, I would say, that uh, at the most, we can uh, say that they were tribal chieftains, Chol, Cher, Pandya, uh, and Satyaputras, and of them, uh, Chol, Cher, and Pandyas uh, were regarded as the big three. So they, they were always fighting with each other, and usually, by the end of the Sangam age, you will find that usually it was for the Marutam area, that is green area, green patch, where cultivation was possible, where resource generation could happen, that is the bone of contention between these kingdoms and between these chieftains. And uh, that is how it goes. Similarly, this is also the period when the peninsular India is very actively engaged uh, in the Indo-Roman trade. And uh, as a consequence of this, what you find is that despite being uh, a prototype of the state, these polities uh, in South India, Cholichere, Pandya, and Satyaputras, they were wise enough to have twin capital systems. And twin capital is something that Telangana and Andhra, they are still toying with this idea. Can they have it? So th these traditions go back to this period. Uh, and why, why did they uh, need to have twin capitals? This was not the practice in North India or Central India. This is precisely because more resources could be had by having very effective control mechanism over uh, coastal area. So they typically would have one inland capital and one capital uh, in the coastal area. So ek tatiya shetra mein razhani unki hoti thi aur ek uh, inland area mein razhani hoti thi. And these constraints, uh, we are living with social constraints. Digital is nothing. <laughs> so uh, anyways, so moving on from there, uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, peninsular uh, detailing of Oh, I can see Archana Verma also. Hello, uh, yes, Archana, sir. how are you? Yes, sir. She has been there since the beginning. Oh, great. Okay. Uh, so, uh, right. So, uh, I was talking about the South Indian uh, uh, chief uh, uh, chieftains, uh, uh, 
depicted uh, in the Sangam age, which uh, leg legitimately belongs to the postmodern period. And the criticality of this to our discussion is that uh, the postmodern times give us ample evidence to understand the dynamic process of state formation. Some historians use this epithet of uh, secondary state formation that is detested by quite a few historians. is phrase ko pasand nahi karte hain kyunki wo samajhte hain ki north se formative uh, civilizational or state influence flow kar raha hai south mein or south may civilizational ya state emergence ke teche impulses formative impulses north se aa rahi hain to is par ek masla hota hai itihaskaron ka lekin if you look at it from the process centric point of view of history to aapko aisa lagega ki post maurya kal jo hai wo dakshin bhartiya rajnaitik ikaiyon ke liye kafi mahatvapurna isliye tha kyunki yahi wo samay hai jab wo ऐसे क्रिटिकल कैपेसिटीज डेवलप कर पाए ऐसे क्रिटिकल रिसोर्सेज डेवलप कर पाए कुछ व्यापार के माध्यम से जो कि इंडो रोमन ल्यूक्रेटिव ट्रेड इस समय हो रहा था उससे पार्टिसिपेट कर कर जैसा कि मैंने आपको बताया कि संगम एज क्वालिटी में सभी छोटे छोटे जो जो चीफ टेन से वो भी इस बात का ख्याल रखते थे कि तटीय क्षेत्र में उनकी एक राजधानी होनी चाहिए और यह निश्चित रूप से इसीलिए था क्योंकि रोमन ट्रेड से जो जो उन्हें मुनाफा हो रहा था जो उन्हें संसाधन की प्राप्ति हो रही थी उसका वो भरपूर फायदा उठा पाए हालांकि अगर आप देखें तो जो रोमन क्वाइंस आ रहा है जो गोल्ड क्वाइंस आ रहा है इस समय उसका प्रयोग वो मार्केट में नहीं कर पा रहे थे क्योंकि दक्षिण भारत में इस समय मार्केट सिस्टम डेवलप नहीं हुआ तो मूलतः जो एक्सचेंज था वो आ, वो बाटर सिस्टम ही था आ, तो इन सिक्कों का वो क्या करते जो गोल्ड क्वाइंस है इंडो रोमन ट्रेड से जो आ रहा था उसका वो क्या करते मार्केट प्रचलित है नहीं मार्केट जो व्यापार जो बाजार व्यवस्था है वो उतनी विकसित थी नहीं तो उसके अभाव में हम पाते हैं कि वो संभवतः इसका प्रयोग बुलियन की तरह कर रहे थे बुलियन का मतलब होता है कि आप उसे क्वाइन के तौर पर एक्सचेंज के लिए नहीं यूज कर रहे हैं लेकिन आप उसे सजावट के लिए या गहने के तौर पर उसका माला बनाकर आप उसका आभूषण के तौर पर प्रयोग कर रहे हैं एंड दैट नेवर द लेस ऑफकोर्स इट वॉज वेल्थ इट वॉज इट वॉज हैविंग सम वैल्यू बट इट डिड नॉट हैव इट डिड नॉट हैव मार्केट वैल्यू एज सच बट ओवर ए पीरियड ऑफ टाइम एज आई जस्ट सेट दैट टूवर्ड्स द एंड ऑफ दी संगम एज वी फाइंड दैट मोस्ट ऑफ दीज चीफ आर fighting with each other to take as much control of the marutam area which has agrarian potential which has the potential to generate more surplus and therefore you will find that the waigai river valley or uh, uh, you have uh, several other uh, areas uh, uh, for example kaveri valley periyar valley in uh, cher uh, in the case of cher they are getting colonized uh, increasingly and by the time you reach uh, the pallav period uh, they they are, they are fairly uh, intensively colonized to the extent that they were able to throw an empire or a state for themselves so this capacity building of having a state system uh, having a state system on uh, premised on the resources of their own is something that happened that unfolded uh, in the post modern times for peninsular india okay so similarly moving on to other uh, dimensions of society if you look at uh, the inscriptional uh, records of uh, the post modern times most of the uh, stupas that we get to see uh, also carried a very extensive uh, although uh, small small uh, uh, inscriptional uh, details uh, getting engraved by a variety of people and they are not necessarily kings or ministers or the ayats as usually was the case this was usually the monopoly of the kings and uh, uh, very well off people to uh, you know get engraved something or to donate something for for some institution or to some groups of uh, religious uh, uh, corporates and so forth but uh, in the post modern times we find very uh, ordinary people uh, artisans masons uh, uh, traders they are also donating 
uh, quite a few resources uh, and uh, they are doing that uh, for uh, different uh, purposes small purposes like building a wall uh, around the uh, around the uh, religious establishment it could be uh, it could be uh, jain establishment it could be buddhist establishment it could even be hindu establishment and uh, uh, the iconic wall around the sachi stoop is something which is a byproduct of around this period of time because the stoop it's in a very skeletal form when it was originally built during the Mauryan period, but uh, much, much of the elaborate structures around it, the circumambulatory path and the uh, wall around it, the gated uh, entry and so forth, that is something which were future additions and quite a few were made around this, uh, this period of time. So these are some of the things that we need to take care of uh, while, uh, while uh, having a grip over uh, what is happening uh, in, in the social domain uh, in the postmodern times. And what does it tell us? It tells us that there is, uh, you can say, uh, improvement in the economic uh, stature of uh, or economic status of uh, uh, the trading class, the merchants, the professionals, uh, who otherwise uh, in the earlier till around the earlier period of time were not able to uh, make these uh, uh, donations of course there were several critical religious changes also and i'll talk about it which allowed them which facilitated this kind of participation uh, of a wider gamut of uh, society but this is also indicative of the economic increased economic prosperity of the professional classes who could now uh, even uh, donate things. And interestingly, you will notice that in these donations, which are referred to in sources as votive donations, uh, you will find that they are not referring to themselves uh, by their caste affiliation. They rather are referring to themselves by their occupational affiliation. And this is something where uh, the doctrines of Buddhism and Jainism becomes uh, critical, becomes important, because uh, uh, in the uh, in the uh, Brahminical Hindu uh, scheme of uh, social arrangement, uh, they probably are not getting their due in social terms, uh, in social states, in social status terms, uh, as they probably are getting it. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, overall purview of buddhism or jainism at around this period of time and uh, of course in the subsequent period we found we, we find the puranic hinduism resorting to more ingenuous ways by which they bring uh, these uh, disparate groups into its own religious fold but in the postmodern times uh, this is this is how things stand so uh, moving on from here uh, let's uh, let's uh, uh, get on to some other uh, detailing in terms of social uh, uh, details. Yes, the Jatak uh, uh, stories uh, tell you about the increased pro prosperity of this merchant class. There are several uh, references of Vanik, uh, which denotes a general trader, Sekhis, uh, which, which denotes a financer, Sarthavah uh, denotes uh, a karma leader. So. Uh, the moment you start getting more terms for a particular profession, that itself is symptomatic of the fact that that profession is the in profession. That profession is now having fair degree of specialization. So uh, that, that tells you about how uh, trade, economy, uh, transactions, commerce is doing well uh, in, in this period of time. And uh, there is uh, uh, even in material terms, if you look at the archaeological uh, specimen of this period, you will find uh, that uh, instead of battle dwarf houses, mud houses, uh, which earlier was a norm uh, till around modern period, now you have uh, uh, burnt brick houses, lime and mortar is used to cement uh, the walls, uh, iron nails are preponderant. So overall, the material uh, uh, condition is also improving in terms of uh, um, artifactual remains that we get from this period. And there is fair degree of a spread of this. And uh, uh, if you look at the agrarian frontiers, again, you find that uh, this is the pe postmodern period is the period uh, when several other areas are uh, perhaps uh, uh, 
undergoing intensification of uh, agriculture, agricultural operations, agricultural calendar is introduced in these areas. Ways and means could have been different. Uh, it could have been as a result of a Brahmadeya, it could have been as a result of Janapada Nivesh, which was one of the critical policies of the uh, uh, Mauryan rulers, where uh, revenue free grants were made uh, to uh, some uh, corporate uh, religious bodies, uh, where uh, for the initial part of uh, uh, the grant, uh, no revenue was extracted from them. Uh, so. What you find in the postmodern times, if you look at the geography of India, uh, for the first time we get to see uh, Mahameg Varmans in the form of uh, Kharvel King coming up in Odisha area. Odisha did not have historical entry in ancient India before this period of time. The talk of the iconic uh, Ashokan war with the, uh, with the Kaling ruler, but no, uh, none of us know who was the uh, Kaling king. Uh, we, we don't know what was the political structure. So uh, if, if you really uh, want to begin the historical period of Kaling, uh, then perhaps you will have to start from the post modern times because this is Hathi Gumpha inscription is the first uh, written uh, uh, evidence that we get from around this period of time and uh, before that uh, there is absolutely no uh, no written evidence so I'm, I'm not discounting that uh, there could not have been other political possibilities but technically Odisha also makes its historical entry only in the uh, postmodern times the same holds true for Maharashtra area or the Andhra area uh, Satvahans in Puranic records are referred to as Andhras and uh, uh, the, the uh, Satvahan inscriptions dating to around 1st century BC and 2nd uh, and 1st century AD, 2nd century AD. Before that, we don't have any uh, such evidence uh, of uh, written uh, record coming from Maharashtra area. So Satvahans also perhaps represent uh, the first instance of second state formation in the Deccan area. And uh, uh, by the second century AD, uh, the, the same process is replicated in the Andhra area also. And uh, we have already referred to the uh, Sangam situation, Sangam literature pertaining to the peninsular India. So that gives you a sense uh, of the uh, expanding agrarian frontiers uh, in uh, the post Mauryan period. And uh, that is, uh, this is the period probably which is so critical to the process of uh, state formation in greater parts of India. And uh, uh, this uh, agrarian community uh, became the mainstream community in greater part of the Indian subcontinent around this period of time. Of course, this was an ongoing process and it uh, continued uh, even up to uh, early medieval period. But this is uh, a vital uh, period where across the Vindhyas we have the spread of uh, uh, state society happening for the first time in Indian history. So this is not just a period sandwiched between the iconic dynasties of the Maurya and the Guptas, but it has more very profound historical significance of its own. Now, moving on uh, from here to uh, the religious domain of uh, the uh, period, we find that across religions, of course, we had Buddhism, we had Jainism, we had uh, uh, Vedic uh, uh, Hinduism uh, present uh, in, in, uh, in India uh, or Indian history. But uh, from around the beginning of the common era, there is a trend that you get to see. And this cuts across all these religions and that is uh, schism or breaking up of big religions into smaller sects. And this is something that is uh, hitting Buddhism, that is hitting Jainism, that is hitting Hinduism as well. So uh, you have Hinayan and Mahayan in Buddhism. Uh, even uh, Mahayan is predated by Mahasanghika's sect that is referred to. And uh, uh, this is um, Mahayan is supposed to be a little bit more uh, innovative. Uh, and open to new ideas as compared to uh, Hinyan, which is uh, perhaps more uh, uh, more orthodox. 
and therefore uh, coming up of uh, the Mahayana sector perhaps allowed uh, the uh, participation of common people uh, for making the grants to temples and so forth. Very petty grants were also made, but that made uh, people uh, participate in the process and that, uh, that, uh, uh, that accorded uh, longevity to the Buddhist traditions. Uh, so that is something that we get to see happening uh, within uh, Buddhism. Again, in Jainism also we find uh, the same uh, Shwetambar and Digambar sects uh, coming up and uh, within that also you have several other subsects uh, with different uh, philosophical and religious orientations and so forth. So schism is something that is happening across uh, religions. In the uh, Vedic Hinduism, similarly, we have Vishnuism, we have uh, Shivism. Now, uh, they are Vedic uh, uh, in the sense that uh, in ultimate analysis, the very small, uh, say, uh, folk uh, deities or uh, uh, tribal deities are accommodated into the larger narrative of the Vedic pantheon of gods and goddesses, and they are somewhat interlinked with it. And therefore, there is a sense of continuity with the Vedic pantheon of gods and goddesses. At the same time, it allows them to participate and become a, uh, become a part and parcel of the overall pantheon of uh, uh, gods and goddesses that the entire Purana uh, is full of. So most of the popular gods and goddesses who we worship today are essentially not Vedic gods and goddesses, but they are Puranic gods and goddesses, but there is no antithesis with the Vedic gods and goddesses because of this process of uh, you know uh, bigger religions uh, um, getting subdivided into smaller sects at the same time that umbilical cord is not snapped altogether. Similarly, uh, we, we spoke of the Mahayana and so forth. The concept of avatar uh, uh, is, is something uh, that, that uh, takes shape at this point of time and uh, not only in Buddhism, but uh, it rubs into uh, uh, Vedic uh, uh, Hinduism as well and subsequently the Puranic Hinduism as well. Uh, the uh, tradition of uh, sculpturing gods and goddesses is something that began at around this point of time. Uh, so uh, uh, you, you will find a lot of uh, uh, similarity uh, in, the, uh, in the Hellenistic uh, treatment of sculptures and the way uh, Mathura art or Gandhar art, uh, schools of art, uh, made sculptures. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, Gautam Buddha, uh, uh, the iconic Gautam Buddha, would look more like uh, uh, a Greek god as compared to uh, someone who was born in Nepal. Uh, but this is not to say that the influence is coming from the uh, uh, from the uh, Hellenistic uh, side only, because prior to that, we also have the sculpturing tradition of Yaksh and Yakshinis uh, coming from uh, Magadh area and so forth. And there is a distinct uh, uh, impact, there is a distinct, uh, you can say, influence that you can see uh, on these sculpturing traditions that we get to see uh, developing in, uh, in Gandhar and Mathura. So uh, that, that is about the uh, religious uh, uh, trajectory of uh, this, this period. And uh, coming back to the larger questions uh, with which we had begun. So having surveyed the political, economic, social and religious detailing, coming back to the larger questions, for example, when we say that, okay, Maurya, uh, for example, if you look at the uh, writings of R.S. Sharma, uh, in perspectives uh, uh, on ancient and uh, perspectives uh, on society and economy of early India. So, you can see that the Prachin Bharti Arthavyavastha and Samaj are very kind of budget, very stages. And the phrase is very important. 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 The phrase is very जबकि पोस्ट मॉडर्न पीरियड जिसकी चर्चा हम लोग कर रहे हैं उसके लिए जो फ्रेज उन्होंने यूज किया है इकोनॉमिक स्टेजेस के लिए स्मॉल फार्म्स मनी इकोनॉमी एंड रोमन ट्रेड नाउ व्हेन यू ट्राई एंड एनालाइज कि क्या डायनेस्टिक चेंज हो जाने के कारण मौर्यों के विघटन मौर्य साम्राज्य के विघटन हो जाने के कारण क्या अर्थव्यवस्था में भी इतना आमूलचूल परिवर्तन आ गया तो फिर हमें यह प्रश्न 
पूछना पड़ेगा मौर्य काल के चित्रण के ऊपर द प्रोजेक्शन ऑफ दी मॉरियन पीरियड कैन बी क्वेश्चन ऑन द बेसिस ऑफ दी फैक्चुअल डिटेलिंग वी हैव फॉर दी पोस्ट मॉरियन टाइम्स और जब पोस्ट मॉरियन टाइम्स में अगर हम यह जानते हैं कि मोस्ट ऑफ दी लैंड आर इंडिविजुअली ओन्ड फॉर विच वी हैव सेवरल इंस्क्रिप्शन एविडेंस ऑल्सो नॉट ओनली इंस्क्रिप्शन बट लिटररी एविडेंस ऑल्सो there are buddhist uh, sources there are satvahan records and so forth that testify to this so if in the post modern times the norm is individual holding of land uh, can it be possible that just 50 years prior to it uh, uh, the norm was uh, state uh, ownership of land and so forth or state control economy and so forth so economy changes usually don't come from the company they don't change as fast as political changes happen so economic changes are more long term the rhythm of economic change is different from the rhythm of rhythm and pace of political changes and these are important things that we should realize so a good understanding of post modern period in fact allows us to question some of the uh, dominant uh, historiographical imagery that have been produced uh, for the morians also and therefore uh, the decentralization debate that we get to see jo vikendriyakaran ka jo vivad hai kendriyakaran aur vikendriyakaran ka vivad hai morio ke sandarbh mein uske bhitar post morian ki jo hamari understanding hai wo hame kafi clarity deti hai cheezon ko samajhne ke liye और ऐसा प्रतीत होता है कि जिस तरीके से हम मौर्यों को जितना केंद्रीकृत समझते थे संभवतः अगर पोस्ट मॉरियन इकोनॉमी को देखें पोस्ट मॉरियन सोसाइटी को देखें तो वो इमेज थोड़ा सा ढीला होता दिखता है एंड दिस इज समथिंग दैट जेल्स विद दी एग्जिस्टिंग स्कॉलरशिप इन हिस्ट्री of uh, over the last 20 30 40 years what a few things in favor of uh, not so centralized imagery of the morians have been uh, attempted uh, similarly there are several other uh, issues related to the iconic silk route and uh, the uh, the uh, the uh, you can say leveraging of the profits uh, acquiring from silk route uh, which actually uh, emerged from china went through the central asia to west asia and finally to the uh, europe uh, or mediterranean coast now uh, as a result of uh, the presence of uh, some empires in iran uh, parthians uh, there were little bit of uh, uh, difference uh, there were there were uh, uh, some problems on account of extortionist policy pursued by these empires and the sheer fact that kushan uh, uh, were uh, the ones who were dominantly present in this area and a large part of the north western and north indian part of uh, uh, land was also under the kushan for a significant period of time for around two centuries or so that meant that uh, this area was used as a kind of uh, conduit or some kind of an alternative route the karakoram pass uh, आज भी अगर आप जियो पोलिटिकल स्ट्रेटेजिस्ट को सुनिए जो चाइना और भारत के संबंध में या पाकिस्तान और भारत के संबंध में डिस्कशन करते हैं तो वो काराकोरम पास वगैरह को यही बताते हैं कि ये दीज आर द एरियाज ऑफ स्ट्रेटेजिक इंपॉर्टेंस डजेंट मैटर इफ देयर इज नो क्रॉप प्रोडक्शन हेयर डजेंट मैटर इफ दिस एरिया इज नॉट हैबिटेबल but india should exercise control over it because it oversees it overlooks a very ancient uh, uh, trade route and uh, built road initiative of china also uh, excites a lot of uh, uh, controversies on account of this uh, particular thing that uh, on account of the disturbance uh, in iran area for a brief period of time this route this land route was resorted to uh, and uh, the silk trade uh, actually uh, ended up through land route to the indus delta and from there it connected with the flourishing indo roman trade uh, 
of which we are very much aware through the uh, writings of, uh, uh, say, Pliny, Strabo, and uh, uh, we have uh, instance of Hippalus, which perhaps stands for uh, the discovery of monsoon by the uh, by the uh, Romans, uh, the phenomena of monsoon in the Indian Ocean, and then uh, we have several stages of. Uh, uh, maritime uh, trade happening from the red sea periplus of uh, periplus meri that is periplus uh, that is the red sea uh, down to the east uh, down to the western coast konkan area and then ultimately through hinterland connected to the coromandel coast and also up to uh, bengal and uh, the, this uh, this did not end here from here it went up to uh, the uh, southeast asia and some of the details uh, without uh, uh, the spices, uh, which we otherwise believe is the dominant uh, item of exchange uh, uh, between the uh, Indians and the uh, Romans. Uh, so there were several other items, for example, ivory, gangetic, gangetic nard, and so forth, which were also exchanged. And uh, items from China, probably, uh, or Southeast Asia, entered the Coromandel coast from there uh, through the inland route or hinterland. It reached the western coast, that is, Konkan coast, from uh, the ports of Muziris and so forth. And from there, it went on to uh, not through the high seas, but along the coastal route, it went up to uh, the Gulf. Uh, went up to Hormuz and there after it entered the Red Sea and so forth. We, so uh, this period is, is, uh, is full of uh, economic activity, not only overland, but also maritime. This period is full of political activities and this political activity is not to be understood merely as uh, fragmentation of an otherwise uh, centralized uh, uh, monolithic uh, uh, state presence in the form of an empire of the Mauryas, but they are very uh, crucial. They are very positive developments in the uh, in the sense of uh, capacity building, resource building to sustain an apparatus like state for themselves in different parts of India. This is a very uh, crucial period for the. Uh, for the expanding frontiers of agriculture in greater part of India, even in Deccan and down south. Uh, this is also uh, a, a very uh, critical period uh, for the evolution of uh, religion uh, through uh, formation of several sects and taking more and more people under its purview and engaging with uh, several deities, smaller deities, connecting them with larger deities and giving them a sense of identity uh, in an Indian terms or as, as some supra-religious terms. So uh, this, is, this is how uh, it uh, unfolded. And I can see uh, that uh, there is not much time left for this session also. Uh, so uh, I would uh, rather end here and uh, uh, just check. Uh, uh, sir, there please are carry any on. Questions. Please carry on. We'll log in for another session uh, because we still have a question answer session to go on. So we uh, okay. log so out we have, and log uh, back in. And uh, same uh, goes for the guests as well. Please join us back. Okay. Okay. So uh, uh, what I've uh, done is to, uh, to uh, highlight uh, the criticality of uh, the postmodern period in understanding quite a few historical uh, issues, which are uh, larger questions uh, of inquiry in early India otherwise. For example, how to understand the process of uh, land ownership uh, from the point of view of what we get to hear of the modern times uh, and uh, what we get to hear um, uh, of early India in the post Gupta period where uh, the process of feudalization probably had set in. So what had intervened in between? Now, what we get uh, uh, as perspective from uh, uh, the postmodern detailing of economy and society is that probably we need to revise the uh, revise our conceptualization of uh, the modern period itself because uh, uh, we have discovered that uh, the uh, political fragmentation is not equal to economic fragmentation and so forth. Uh, similarly, uh, the uh, leveraging of the international trade by smaller polities is something which became possible and it, it did not work as some kind of a detriment. So smaller polities did not mean rupture of economic activities. 
and uh, despite this logical argument that smaller polities will lead in multiple taxation points and that is something that the merchants should avoid and so forth uh, well uh, historically it appears it otherwise economically it appears logical but historically uh, we have direct example where this logic gets punctured so uh, it is said of the economists that they presume rationality as uh, as uh, the ultimate thing of uh, uh, economic decision making but uh, history tells us that uh, that was not always the case and uh, uh, multiple taxation points uh, or maybe that they had some other uh, ways and means by which they found it more lucrative to use the uh, indian uh, Uh, land route and uh, connect uh, through the uh, indian ocean to the red sea rather than take that uh, uh, age old established uh, land route which constituted silk route across the central asia uh, taking them uh, across to west asia and then uh, entering uh, into the mediterranean coastal market so uh, these are some of the critical insights that we get from a detailed analysis of the post modern uh, times the post modern economy the post modern uh, society similarly tells us uh, quite a few things uh, that uh, at around this point of time uh, we have uh, several uh, several uh, groups uh, of uh, the world hierarchy that were doing economically uh, quite well and they sought their social identification not in terms of caste uh, but in terms of their profession and uh, the triumphant uh, uh, religions of uh, this period like buddhism and jainism uh, emphasized uh, this particular aspect they they uh, reduced for example uh, in buddhism you just have two categories uh, uch jati and nich jati instead of the fourfold varna division that we have in the vedic brahmanism so forth so all these things uh, do uh, pertain to uh, this period and uh, quite a few changes were happening at around this point of time which accorded a distinct social dynamics to uh, to the post modern period and uh, uh, similarly we saw uh, in the religious domain and similarly we saw in the political domain so uh, by and large that uh, takes care of the uh, pith and substance of uh, the detailing of the post modern times and we have also seen uh, as to how they relate to some of the major issues uh, uh, that constitute uh, polemics or that constitute debates uh, among historians related to uh, the uh, centralized character of maurya or the uh, economic and social changes arrival of feudalism land ownership issue uh, caste dynamics and so forth uh, i have missed out in terms of talking about the mixed castes and the increasing number of mixed castes ultimately getting galvanized into the caste system in in different uh, denominations so all these things are happening the element of bhakti is coming uh, for the first time in this period uh, uh, mahabharat uh, uh, tells you a lot about it uh, the uh, uh, the uh, the sacrificial uh, mode of worshiping gives way to uh, some kind of uh, individual faith and reliance on individualized gods uh, uh, doing the way with the intermediaries in between and so these are different ways and means by which different religious denominations tried to uh, float themselves during this uh, transformative times try to make themselves uh, uh, relevant to apne aap ko sarthak siddh karne ke liye kai parivartan sabhi dharmo mein hum dekh rahe hain and they are all trying to reach out to as many number of people as they could by tweaking their uh, uh, their uh, sects by bringing about some kind of change uh, in their philosophical thinking in their uh, rites and rituals in allowing some facilities for example i discussed about the mahayan and so forth where even uh, common people could uh, give donations to uh, different uh, establishments and so forth and therefore it became more and more participative there is more democratization you can say that uh, it became more participative all religions across board so these are some of the distinct uh, characteristic features of the post modern times and that is something that we can gain insight from 
so far as uh, a historical analysis of the post modern times are concerned so that is it uh, now uh, let's see if there are people still interested uh, uh, despite this uh, somewhat longish uh, description of uh, the post modern times uh, and uh, i would love if uh, some students or faculty uh, have some question i would love to answer them thank you uh, over to you abhishek sir the question answers thank you very much sir uh, i just would like 